The discovery of the Hermeticum during the Renaissance created a new generation of occultists. They sought to combine religion with science and magic, a dangerous undertaking in a society ruled by Christianity. John Dee would risk his life to study its teachings. John Dee was a giant. John Dee was the embodiment of the ideal of an enlightened being who had the uh, spiritual understanding of his role and mission in life and who was gifted with, you know, superior intelligence. But like Pythagoras, he would pay a heavy price for daring to seek out the wisdom of the gods. The ultimate Renaissance man, Dee followed in the footsteps of Paracelsus, using experimentation to become a gifted scientist, an inventor, a mathematician, a brilliant cryptographer, and a pioneer in the field of navigation. But he was also an occultist, he was a sorcerer, he was an astrologer, he was in fact Queen Elizabeth's personal court astrologer. And in that sense, his interests were all very much in keeping with the thinking of the time. There wasn't a distinction made between magic and science, and he was pursuing an understanding of the world around him. When Queen Elizabeth rose to the throne of England in 1558, she installed Dee as court astrologer. But his influence reached far beyond his position. England's famous magician was also a spy for the Queen. He was involved with political intrigue. He was a uh, trusted ally of, of the uh, Queen, but he was also working behind the scenes throughout Europe to help to lower the power of the church and to substitute Protestant power in its stead. With Dee's guidance, Queen Elizabeth officially legitimized the most significant occult science of the Renaissance, alchemy. Alchemists had two goals, to heal illness and to turn base metal into gold. They believed success could be achieved by finding the Philosopher's Stone a mystical agent that would also produce a higher level of consciousness in the alchemist. That was really an approach to trying to understand the way the physical world works, and alchemy as a practice you know, was the forefather of modern chemistry. Alchemy had existed since the early Egyptians, but in the hands of the Renaissance scientists, it reached new heights. Everything that we know and do today in our modern science was uh, developed by the alchemists. Laboratory techniques were part of the alchemical tradition. The observation of results, the scientific method, is, is a child of alchemy. Alchemists were on the leading edge of science. They discovered phosphorus, zinc, the distillation of alcohol, the germ nature of diseases. They were the first to understand how blood circulates in the body. The church viewed their unorthodox experiments and scientific breakthroughs with growing suspicion. We are speeding up what nature does. We're speeding up the rate at which the metals evolve. We're speeding up the rate at which medicines are combined and, and raise consciousness. And the church felt that you can't be speeding up God's creation without recourse to demons. November of 1558, Bloody Mary Tudor died and Elizabeth I succeeded the throne. Elizabeth asked Dee personally to choose her coronation date, which she selected as January 15th, 1559. Later that year, Leonard Diggs, the inventor of the telescope, died and passes wardenship of his son, Thomas, to Dr. Dee. In 1562, in Antwerp, John Dee met with William Silvius, a printer, and in 1563, Dee traveled to Urbino and Rome. In 1564, Dee met proto-family of love cultists in Hungary. Johann Rademacher recommended him a book in the shop of Arnold Berkman. This book was Stenographia in three volumes, written in 1499 and blacklisted from 1609. The third volume was not published until 1606, 
and later used as the cipher manuscripts by the Golden Dawn. The book described cryptographic depiction using spirits to communicate over very long distances, and was by Abbe Johann Trithemius, 1462-1516, who was the teacher of both Henry Cornelius Agrippa and Paracelsus. Immediately after reading Steganographia, John Dee wrote the Monus Hieroglyphica and dedicated it to the newly coronated Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian II, a Habsburg. The Monus was written in Antwerp and took 13 days to write from January 13th to the 24th, and it was published by Silvius in March of 1564. At that time, John Dee was 37 years old, the same age as Maximilian II, and it was in that July that Maximilian II, 1527 to 1576, was made the King of Hungary, Bohemia, and the Holy Roman Empire. In 1565, D returned to London, and in 1566 he obtained the rectorship of Long Leadenham in Lincolnshire. In that year he moved to Mortlake with his mother Jane and began his library of 3,000 plus scrolls and 1,000 plus bound books. 1567 D took copious notes on Vitruvius de Architectura and Roger Cook became John Dee's apprentice. In 1582, Dee worked briefly with scryer Barnabas Saul, and two days later would meet Edward Kelly. Despite his work in alchemy, Dee's true occult passion lay in divination. He believed that he could apply scientific methods to communicate with supernatural beings. Dee's obsession with contacting the angels would have disastrous consequences. This art of manipulating objects like bones, tea leaves, and tarot cards had arrived from the Muslim East in the 14th century and become a popular method of fortune telling. But Dee used a divination method known as scrying. Dee relied on looking into a crystal ball that would reflect back supernatural information. Scrying is a long time old technique. Scrying into glasses, mirrors, bodies of water, anything that would have a reflective surface, uh, and see if you could see not just the material things, but the spiritual things standing behind. These efforts were unsuccessful until one day a young man named Edward Kelly appeared at his door. Kelly seemed to have the talent to see into the shadow world. Their system involved Edward Kelly looking into a amethyst crystal and describing what he saw and John Dee would then record these uh, communications. Kelly began receiving messages from the angels. They spoke in a language he called Enochian, from the lost biblical book of Enoch. These transmissions are early examples of what New Age followers now call channeling. What Dee and Kelly brought forth was completely new. It was not based on tradition. He appeared to be speaking a new language. The Enochian language does appear to have a coherent vocabulary and syntax, and this doesn't seem like the sort of thing that Kelly, who was not a particularly educated or schooled person, could have just invented. He couldn't have faked something like that. John Dee and Kelly embarked on a tour of Europe to share their discoveries, just as the Inquisition launched another crackdown against heretics. All you needed was a slight change in political or religious circumstance, and something that was considered exceptionally wonderful would then be considered demonic and scary. Dee returned home to England to find that a mob had destroyed his irreplaceable library and scientific and occult instruments. Dee had fallen out of favor with the court. The man who began as a leading scientist of the Renaissance ended his life penniless, branded as a sorcerer. Dee's main legacy was not to science, it is to magic. And it's because of those who have come after, who have seized upon what he created and made it into a new worldview, whether it's consciousness arts or ceremonial magic or divination, could take place inside these new parameters that they set up. John Dee's fall was the beginning of the occult's end. The practices were reviled by the church as the work of demonic possession. From the 14th 
through the 16th century, more than 40,000 people would be executed for witchcraft.